Okay, I think we're live now, so there we go. Uh, so can I welcome everybody again to the uh, December meeting of Tactan? Um, and can I open the meeting? I know people have heard this before, um, but I'm going to go through quickly the, the kind of um, housekeeping type things. So welcome to this uh, virtual meeting of the Tactan board in terms of Section 43 of the Local Governance in Scotland Act 2003. The Tactan board is entitled to hold meetings in this way. We have tested the communications, hopefully, and uh, all members in attendance can confirm uh, and with all members in, can, in attendance and can confirm that these that, that that all members can fully participate in the meeting. Should any member need to leave the meeting for any reason, can they please use the meeting chat to advise of this? If a member loses their connection, they should make every effort to rejoin the meeting and can uh, hopefully contact Ashley by email for assistance. If that's not possible, um, your absence will be noted for the remain remainder of the meeting. If you have to leave due to a declaration of interest, you should remain out of the meeting until invited back in by staff. Uh, would all members please mute their microphones when not speaking to avoid background noise? Committee officers can and will mute uh, anyone that forgets, so please ensure that you unmute before speaking. Please start the meeting with your camera on. Your face will appear on the screen when you are speaking. Um, if your connection is poor, you may wish to turn off your camera and see if this improves it. If this doesn't help, you may wish to quickly leave the meeting and rejoin. If you wish to ask a question, speak on any item or move a motion or amendment, please do so by typing in the meeting chat. So, I, so if you want to speak, please um, indicate in the meeting chat and then I will invite you to speak. Although this is, although we are operating in a different way, this is still a formal meeting of the TACTRAM board and the required standards of behaviour and discussion are the same as in face-to-face -face meetings. Unless otherwise agreed, standing orders will apply to the proceedings and the terms of the Code of Conduct will apply in the normal way. Um, can also remind members that the press and public are invited to view this meeting online. Uh, the meeting will be recorded to assist uh, officers in capturing points made during the meeting. As per uh, all meetings of the board, it would be my hope that we reach uh, decisions by consensus. However, if it is necessary, if necessary, the nature of this meeting makes it impossible to take a vote by way of a show of hands because we can't see everybody at the same time. For that reason, I'm proposing that all decisions that are required will be taken by means of a roll call vote. To agree this, I require agreement from at least two thirds of the members present. And ask if anyone disagrees with that proposal to open their microphone and indicate now. I'm going to take that as uh, uh, that no one has disagreed and we'll record that as a unanimous vote uh, to, to, to use a unanimous decision to use roll call votes for all substantive decisions at this meeting. Uh, where items are for noting or where there has been no dissent expressed during the debate, I would intend to call any member that has a contrary view to say so either verbally or through the chat function, and if there's no response, I will assume that the matter is agreed. So uh, hopefully that is uh, our housekeeping for today. So um, can I just ask who, who we have apologies from? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just to confirm, we have apologies from Councillor Danny Gibson and from Councillor David Ellingworth. We also have apologies from Councillor Mark Flynn, but we have Councillor Lynn Short substituting today. At the moment, I don't think we have on the call um, Councillor Stephen Rome, Heather Anderson or Brian Doyle, but I believe they are trying to connect, so hopefully um, may join us soon. OK, <clears throat> so um, can I ask uh, if anyone has uh, any declarations of interest at this point? If you want to uh, indicate in the chat. Oh, Mr Doyle is here. Um, can I welcome um, Dr Jonathan Berg and uh, Mrs Amy Macdonald to the first meeting and I, I don't think Stephen has, uh, I don't think, I don't think Stephen Rome has, uh, has, has turned up yet but if he, if he has can I welcome Councillor Stephen Rome to, uh, to the meeting as well. Um, I might need to ask everybody to brief, very briefly introduce themselves, given that there are uh, new people here. Um, I know this is very difficult to do, um, <clears throat> so uh, I'll, I'll start. Um, I'm Councillor Richard McCready. I'm the Chair of TACTAN. I'm a councillor in Dundee, so uh, let me see. 
Ashley, you're the first person in my list here, so Ashley, who are you? Oh. Not right. Okay, Brian Doyle, you, would you like to introduce yourself briefly? Very well, is it? Um, I did click on mute, but it didn't work. Sorry, right. I'm Ashley Roger. I'm the office manager for Tactran and minute taker for today's meeting. Brian, are you there? He is present, but I don't know why he's not able to talk. OK. Oh. Uh, Councillor Mark McDonald. Good morning, I'm Councillor Mark McDonald. I'm an Angus councillor. Uh, Provost Ronnie Proctor. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, Ronnie Proctor, uh, councillor in Angus. Councillor Alistair Bailey. <clears throat> hey, good morning, folks. Councillor Alistair Bailey. I'm a councillor on Perth and Kinross Council for the Castle Gallery. Thanks. Okay. Councillor Andrew Parrott. Good morning, Councillor Andrew Parrott. I'm a councillor for Perth City Centre Ward on Perth and Kinross Council, and I'm also vice convener of Tactran. Thank you. OK, we're on to some officers now. Donald Coyne. Coyne. Good morning, yes. Uh, Donald Coyne from Perth and Ross Council, an accountant with the Council, um, representing Scott Walker, who is the Treasurer. OK, uh, Ewan Gourley. Hi, uh, Ewan Gourley, Dundee City Council, kind of traffic and transportation team leader. <clears throat> OK, uh, Ewan McNaughton, there's prizes if you can tell the two Ewans apart. <laughs> Ewan McNaughton, Dundee City Council, Head of Sustainable Transportation Arrows. OK, uh, Councillor Jim Thompson. You there? Uh, sorry, I was on mute there. Typical. Sorry. Yeah, Jim Thompson, Stirling Council. Thank you. OK, uh, Dr Jonathan Berg. Uh, good morning, uh, Jonathan Berg. I'm a consultant clinical geneticist uh, at Nine Wells and a senior lecturer for the University of Dundee. And in between times, I live out in Newtal and I'm a keen cyclist if I have to declare a vague interest in <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much and welcome to your first meeting. Um, yes. Jonathan Padmore. Morning, Jonathan Padmore, senior strategy officer at Tactran. Okay, Councillor Lynn Short. Just for you, Richard, I don't know if I'm the Fairy of Christmas present, past or future, but I'm standing in for Councillor Mark Lindsay and I'm Councillor Lynn Short from Dundee City Council, putting a wee bit of gender balance into your committee this morning. Thank you very much and um, welcome along. Um, Marianne Scott. Hi, I'm uh, Marianne Scott, the Regional Cycle Training Development Officer for Cycling Scotland, and I sit in the Tatran office. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mark Speed. Good morning, everybody. I'm Mark Speed. I'm the Director of Tatran. Okay, Mary Scott. Good morning, um, Mary Scott, and I'm the uh, Project Officer for Tatran. Uh, Neil Gardner. Morning, Neil Gardner. Uh, I'm the Senior Partnership Manager at TACLAN. Uh, Neil Moran. Morning, everybody. Yes, I'm Neil Moran, uh, one of the strategy officers at TACLAN. Okay, uh, Paul Cronin. Morning, Paul Cronin, a non, non councillor member of the board here and engineering manager at Sustrans by day. Scott Henry. Morning, I'm Scott Henry from Perth and Kinross Council. I'm the secretary and standards officer for the board. And Walter Scott. Thanks, Kavina. Uh, Walter Scott. Service Leader, Roads and Transportation, Angus Council. Uh, a special welcome to Jonathan. Good to see you here today. Thank you. OK, and I think we now have uh, Councillor Stephen Rome. Stephen, I don't know if you missed it, but I did welcome you to your first meeting. I'm not sure if you were on the call at that point. Do you want to 
briefly introduce yourself if you can. Hi, thanks Richard for some bother logging in this morning. Yeah. Um, Councillor Stephen Rome, I'm the Councillor for the North East Ward in Dundee. OK, I think I've covered everybody. If uh, if you think you need to introduce yourself and you haven't, can you? Um, can you say so? Um, I think uh, I hi there, uh, convener. It's uh, Kevin Arkey here, uh, Transport Development Team Leader at Stirling Council. OK, sorry about that. Sorry, I must have skipped over you there. Sorry, my, my, I was trying to read, it, read the list off my screen. Thanks very much. OK, <coughs> um, so I know I know that wasn't great, but I just think that you know one of the things we're missing is the opportunity to have a cup of coffee and, and for new people to speak to other people and things like that. And I was trying to replicate that, but I know I know that didn't that doesn't particularly work well. But it's very very hard to get people to know who everybody else was. So can we move on to the agenda and uh, item two, the minutes of the meeting of the fifteenth of September? Has anybody got any? Uh, Issues or concerns with that minute? No, that looked good. Thank you. Is it? Is it? Can we agree the agree the minute? Agreed. I'm yep. taking that as agreed. agreed. Yep. Okay. No hands yep. up and no comments. Yeah. We move on then to. Uh, Item three, which is on the appointment of councillor and non-councillor members. Can I invite um, the, the director, um, Mark Speed, to uh, introduce the report, please? Good morning, everybody. Sorry, sorry for the delay there. Just a, a little problem with the, the mute button. Uh, yeah, so as board members will recall, uh, the executive committee was asked to carry out a recruitment process to bring in um, two new non-councillor members of the board. Um, that was carried out um, and the position was offered to um, Jonathan Berg and Amy McDonald. Uh, we got confirmation yesterday from um, from the cabinet uh, minister that uh, he is happy with those appointments. So all that is left, Councillor McCready, is for the rest of the board to endorse the recruitment of those two non-councillor members, and for us also, as you've already done, to welcome Councillor um, Stephen Rome uh, to the board on behalf of Dundee City Council. Okay. Um, any questions about that? Um, reasonably straightforward. Happy to agree the recommendations that we accept those two appointments and also welcome Councillor Rome. Agreed. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> now we're on to item four, which is the annual report. Can I again invite uh, Director Mark Speed to uh, present the report and then uh, any questions after that? So Mark. Thank you, Chair. Um, yep. So, as as all board members who uh, are, are, are regulars on the board will know, uh, it's a requirement for TACTRAN to um, submit an annual report um, to the Scottish Government, uh, and also that report is required to go to all constituent local authorities. Um, we've written that report, a great deal of detail in the um, in the annex of that report. Uh, credit was given to the predecessor for myself, um, Tom, who was director for most of that period. Um, we thank him for his um, for his work, um, and I'm pleased to say that Tatra has made really good progress during that financial year period. Um, yep, we've got a question from Lynn Short. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, it, it, was actually, it was actually a question with regards to um, page 18 um, and the Northwest Dundee Active Travel Design Study. Um, and um, just just to make the rest of the board uh, aware, after the Two Cities Deal meeting on uh, Friday, myself and Mark had a, a very long conversation, a very, very long conversation. Um, and 
uh, I asked him uh, with regards to some uh, reports that we had with regards to active travel in some of the wards across the city. And this was the kind of report that I was talking about, um, Mark, and it's just to uh, make sure that we're not actually spending um, public funds for these types of reports and them kind of gathering dust on shelves, or I don't know what if dust on shelves, what the equivalent is nowadays when it's uh, meetings like this, um, but just to make sure that they're not just reports, but they're actually, dare I say, oven ready reports, so that uh, when funding comes in for things like Spaces for Everyone uh, and funding for active travel, that we can just pick up and go. Um, what is the uh, conversation with the local authorities with regards to these reports becoming a reality on our streets? Because obviously active travel is very much uh, the, the byword at the moment. OK, th thanks for your question, Councillor Short. Um, this is a report on what we have done over the last financial year against the so the, the, the regional transport strategy has key performance indicators in there. And this report looks at those key performance indicators to make sure that we are doing what we are required to do and that we are doing that to a certain level of quality. In terms of ensuring that you know new projects are coming through, there's a new um, national transport strategy. We're just going through, there's a paper later on in the agenda about the strategic transport review, which is the projects that government are considering taking forward at the moment. And as you're aware, we are now in the process of starting to write a new regional transport strategy which is actually written for and on behalf of the local authorities. And we are working with officers to make sure that all the projects that are um, suitable are being put forward um, for those documents. So this is a report on what has happened. Um, it's, a re it's a report on the progress we've made and how well we have done. Does that answer the question? Sorry. Not really, but I'll maybe take it off table with my colleagues from Dundee and okay. speak to them about it. Maybe come back to you. Thank you. OK, I'm, I'm happy to have a further conversation with you as well, Councillor Shaw. Yeah, that, 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 that would be helpful, Councillor Shaw. OK, any other questions on, on the annual report? OK, can we agree the recommendation to consider and approve for publication and submission? to Scottish Ministers the Tech Tran Annual Report for 2019-20. Agreed. Agreed. <clears throat> um, can we move on to um, item five, um, which is budget and monitoring. Um, as he introduced himself earlier, Donald Coyne is here on behalf of the, the Treasurer. Uh, Donald, I don't know if you've anything to say to introduce the report. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, well, Go through the report. Um, do you hear me OK? Yeah. Yes. Can you hear yeah, that's, fine. that's great. Um, so this paper provides a monitoring update on the partnership's revenue and capital budget and income and expenditure. And it asks the partnership to note the, the core revenue expenditure to the 31st of October, as detailed in Appendix A. Um, also note the RPS revenue programme income and expenditure to 31st of October as detailed in appendices B and C and also note progress in the capital programme and related expenditures detailed in appendix D. The partnership is also asked to approve the proposals at sections 3.4 to 3.6 for the use of 2021 core budget underspend. Um, approve a revised RTS revenue programme with detailed in appendix C delegate authority to the Executive Committee to endorse any submissions to Transport Scotland's Mass Innovation Fund, yeah. and delegate authority to the Partnership Director and Treasurer to approve the use of the remaining contingency budget in the RTS Revenue Programme budget. So I'll just move on. Sections 3.1 to 3.6 of the report provide an update on the projected outcome for the year, as shown in Appendix A. And it's currently estimated there'll be a surplus of approximately £23,000 for the year. So the partnership will recall that at the meeting in September that a reserve of uh, £15,000 was established um, that was approved in September and that's approximately 3% of the core budget and that was to be built up at £5,000 per annum over the current and next two financial years. So sections 3.4 to 3.6 of the report provide proposals for the use of the current year underspend and these actually include that the £15,000 reserve is established in full in the current year £7,000 of the underspend is earmarked for use in the new financial year and the remainder is used to augment the RTS revenue programme in 21-22. Uh, 
Um, sections 3.7 to 3.65 provide an update on the individual elements making up the RTS revenue programme. And these include proposals to update specific budgets in line with the anticipated expenditure for the year. The proposals do not impact upon the overall RTS budget for the year, they just simply reallocate budget between specific budget lines. And advised in section 3.52 of the report, uh, Transport Scotland will launch round two of the MAS Innovation Fund in January, and the further bids are to be submitted. It's proposed that endorsement will be sought from the Executive Committee in February. Um, section 3.64 of the report provides proposals for arrangements of the environment of the remaining contingency budget to other budget headings within the current RTS revenue programme budget. And finally, sections 3.66 to 375 of the report provide an update on the 2021 capital programme and further detail is provided in Appendix D. Happy to take any questions. OK, thank you very much, Mr Coyne. Um, I think we have a, que <coughs> have a question from Councillor Short. Um, thank you. Um, it's actually with regards to um, the rationale of funding going from Sustrans to Tatran to Sistra, um, and I see on 3.25 that um, the reports are going to go on the Tatran Tran website. Um, I'm not sure how many Perth and Kinross Stirling and uh, Angus councillors there are, but I can't imagine many of my colleagues will be looking through the Tatran website to find these reports. Will they be going somewhere into the local councils so they can see um, the, the uplift and the attitudinal change as well? Because I think it's something that's quite important for us all to be aware of uh, with, when it comes to this money being spent and the changes that we're seeing with uh, climate change and the COVID uh, outbreak. OK, um, any officer want to answer that one? I mean... So, so I come in there, Councillor Prudy. Yeah. yeah, so just on, on your first point there, Councillor Short, uh, we deal with the funding mechanisms as, as, they, as they are available. Um, so funding goes to um, Sustrans, it goes to other partners, Pass for All, for Cycling Scotland, um, through the Active Travel Grant. Um, those organisations come up with a programme of delivery. They get funded for that and we, we, we bid, just like anybody else would bid, for funds from, from, that, um, from those organisations to carry out particular projects. Once we have that funding, it is in our purview to procure the services that are required if we can't carry them out in-house in with ourselves or with our local authority colleagues. So, we just work within the um, the framework of funding that is available. Does that answer the first question? Yes, thank you, it does. OK, in terms of the second question, um, these papers are submitted. Um, as you know, they go to the, the, the councillors who sit on the board and the non-board members. They also go to officers. Um, I'll be happy to take that question into our regional transport liaison group about how the officers can get that information to a wider audience of councillors, um, and I'd be happy to do that. Okay, that's excellent. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think I think Councillor Schrott raised a, uh, an important issue there. I think that you know the the spaces for people projects are important. So I think it's uh, I think we, you know if we can disseminate the, the the research we've got on that, I think that would be that would be helpful. But I, I, I also hear the director saying that you know that he's uh, endeavouring to do that, but I can. Uh, recommend a, a, a good read um, on, on on the website for for those uh, those reports. Any other questions on uh, on this item? Okay, um, Mr. Coyne kind of uh, read out all the recommendations. Are we happy to accept those recommendations? Happy to take silence as agreement for a wee a, a little minute or two. Happy to accept. Yeah. OK, can we move on then to um, item six, which is the core revenue budget? Um, Sorry, Chair, just before we move on, um, Councillor Rome has indicated yeah. as a comment on the on the okay. paper. Yeah. Councillor Rome. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, apologies for the brusqueness. This laptop's not really keeping up with things, despite the fact it's new. Um, 
It was really a small comment on the finance section. I understand that obviously a lot has changed this year and there's a lot of adaptions being made, underspend and so on. Just going forward as a small presentational thing, it would be helpful if we had the, the current budget as well as the proposed future budget next to each other, because reading it is, is very confusing as a newcomer coming in trying to, to work out what has changed and how much of a percentage of budget has been impacted, uh, if that's clear. I know that it, it is table later on, but it would be clear reading the report if you had both figures side by side. Just a small presentational thing for the next budget. OK, um, I think officers will certainly have heard that. Uh, Councillor Roman will... will happy, happy to take that on board. Yeah. Thank you. Um, can we move on? Um, move on to item six then. Um, again, um, Don Coyne on behalf of the Treasurer is going to present this report. Uh, Mr Coyne. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, so paper six is, um, deals with the 21-22 core revenue budget and it recommends that the partnership <laughs> approves the 21-22 core revenue budget. It uh, requests that the partner councils make provision for the respective funding contributions within their 21-22 revenue budgets and agrees to receive a report with a finalised 21-22 core revenue budget and a proposed 21-22 RTS revenue programme budget at the next meeting. So for the purpose of preparing the 21-22 core budget, it's been assumed that staff will return to the office on the 1st of April 21 and the approved 2021 20, core budget has therefore been used to establish the budget estimates for the new financial year. Now that may or may not move, and uh, but for the purpose of you actually setting the budget, that's the, the best estimate we can use at the moment. But then we can refine the, the figures obviously if uh, more information comes to light going forward. Um, it's also been assumed that council contributions towards the core costs will be maintained for a further year at £103,000. And it's anticipated that confirmation of the draft Scottish Government budget will be published on 28th of January 21. And it's been assumed again that the Scottish Government grant and aid funding will be maintained for a further year at £522,750. So the proposed budget for staff costs assumes a 3% pay award in 2021, which is in line with the, the Council at the moment. Um, and also included in the budget is a £7,000 relocation allowance, which remains in use from 2021 and will be funded from the earmarked reserves. Majority of other budget lines remain in keeping with uh, 2021, the only exception being insurance, which has been increased to reflect market prices, and other third party payments, which is reduced from the budget last year as consultancy to cover a vacant post is no longer required. So the total core budget for the new financial year is approximately 485,000, which is an increase of it's about 12,000 pound from last year. And that's equivalent to a 2.5% increase, is mainly due to estimates for pay uplifts. Um, appendix to the report provides further detail, and again, happy to take any questions. Okay, <clears throat> anyone got any questions on that report? Um, yes, I wonder if you can hear me. It's board member Amy McDonald. Yes. Um, um, just my my question is on the, the staff costs. We had an underspend this year on staff costs, um, and going forward next year, the budget increases is forty thousand pounds on the predicted outturn this year. So I was just wondering if last year's budget um, um, ex budgeted expenditure contains <coughs> a number of um, staff mm -hmm. vacant posts. And that's why we are forecasting a significantly higher spend next year. Yes, uh, Amy, yeah, the uh, the budget last year was set based, there was a vacant post. Um, mm -hmm. And what actually happened was the budget was actually moved to third party payments to cover the post because we engaged consultancy instead of actually recru uh, recruiting. The post is now filled. So yeah, that explains uh, the movement between the years. Great, thank you. Uh, Councillor Alistair Bailey, you've got a question. Thank you, Chair. Um, I saw there was a reference in the report to um, the, the lease or the rental agreement on the office space coming up in, I think it was November um, 2021, and it said that there is an assumption for budgetary purposes that the that we'll be able to renew at the same rate. I think that's good for budgetary purposes, but I was just looking for a bit of background, please, on um, 
or maybe some reassurance that we will be carrying out some kind of market assessment to check that the rate is still competitive and indeed that the accommodation is um, suitable for how TACTRAN looks now and in the post-COVID world in terms of our needs for office space. Thank you. Is it okay if I come in there, Councillor? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, I can't remember exactly off the top of my head, but yeah. So, so the um, accommodation runs till November, but there's a there's a grace period that we would have to give notice if we were going to change that accommodation as well. Uh, before that, before we commit to staying in that um, office, I'll be conducting a, a, a review of options around that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. Uh, any other questions on this item? <coughs> can we agree that, <coughs> excuse me, can we agree the recommendations are set out at paragraph 1.1? Agreed. Okay, thank you. <coughs> excuse me, can we move on then to item 7 um, and can I invite uh, Neil Gardner to present uh, th this uh, report, Neil? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, this uh, report provides an update on progress with the National Transport Strategy Delivery Plan and the Strategic Transport Projects Review. Work on both of these uh, paused in the spring with Transport Scotland's resources being diverted elsewhere due to the COVID-19 pandemic and work actually only rec recommenced in autumn of this year. Um, in terms of the National Transport Strategy, the delivery plan is now proposed for publication during December 2020, so later this month, and will be a, a short term document with annual reviews and monitoring. This will also be accompanied by a working with partners document as uh, Transport Scotland actually recognised the need for all stakeholders to engage in delivering the NTS. The document is programmed for publication early to mid 2021 and uh, we are still to get more details on this and what it will look like. Um, in terms of the strategic transport projects review, Transport Scotland has now just re-engaged with the various regional transport working groups. As you'll be aware, TACTRAN is a member of two of those, the Tay Cities and the Forth Valley groups. Um, and Transport Scotland has noted that the STPR will now be a two-phase process. So phase one, we're really looking at quick wins, aiming to be published early next year. Phase two, we'll be looking at more major interventions and long term interventions, and that's scheduled to be published at the latter part of 2021. Um, as part of this work, Transport Scotland is aiming to complete case for change reports by mid January, and they're currently liaising with the regional transport working groups on long lists of options. Um, the intention then is for Transport Scotland to publish the case for change documents in January for an eight week consultation period. Um, should the timing of the consultation period not allow the board to consider and approve a response at its meeting in March, the board will be asked to delegate this to the executive committee. So therefore it is recommended that the partnership notes the update and delegates authority to the exec committee to consider and approve a response <coughs> to the STPR case for change reports if the timescale requires. And happy to take questions. Okay, Councillor Short has a question. Um, oh, sorry. It was just uh, to clarify with Mr Speed, haven't had the conversation on Friday with regards to the uh, bridge manager and the really kind of uh, integral gateway that the Tay Road Bridge is um, for the Tay Cities region. Um, and just to uh, confirm that we will be looking for the bridge to be involved in uh, the regional transport working groups. I think it's a really important uh, pivotal part of the wider story and uh, may even look to get permission from the board to speak to uh, the CABSEC with regards to getting uh, a board member incorporated onto TATRAN, but we can uh, look to that in the future. But it was just to, to give you that uh, confidence that we are really keen to be involved in these conversations. Okay, I think that's, uh, I think it's the conversation between yourself and, and Mr Speed is, is, is going on. I think that's helpful. I don't know if he wants to say anything. Yeah, uh, Councillor Short, hopefully you've received um, an invitation uh, to, to a meeting. If not, it'll be coming out very shortly. 
Um, I've asked um, Ashley to, to, to arrange that meeting, which will be a discussion between myself, you and Alan. I've also put a meeting in, as I said I would, with Alan separately for me to have a conversation and, and to see how we can link information between Tactran and what we are doing at a regional level and making sure that the, the bridge's voice is heard. OK, anyone else got any questions on this item? Can we uh, agree the recommendations and can I say that we will, notwithstanding um, about the delegation, I think we I think this is an important piece of work that we will try, we'll, we'll make every effort to keep uh, all members of the board in, involved in the, any decision, any decisions that we're taking, even if we you know, technically have to devolve them to the, uh, you know, or delegate them, sorry, to the, the executive committee. But I think this is important that everybody has some sight of what we're saying. But in an ideal world, it will, will bring stuff to the full uh, full board meeting. But um, the timescales are not within Tactran's uh, gift, unfortunately. OK, we're happy to agree that. OK, I'm taking that as agreed. Um, then we're moving on to item eight, which is the director's report. Can I ask Mr Speed to uh, introduce the report or? Uh, yeah, to introduce the report. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor McCready. So the uh, report, the report asked the, um, the partnership to note updates on the following. The Tay Cities Regional Deal, the Tatran Regional Transport Transition Plan, the Bus Partnership Fund and various cycling initiatives. The partnership is also asked to note responses to the Scotland's Road Safety Framework 2030, free bus travel for people uh, in Scotland under the age of 19, and to delegate authority to the Executive Committee to consider and approve a response to the Scottish Government's Cleaner Air for Scotland 2 consultation. So just in terms of recommendations, I'll uh, just repeat that. So notes the updates on the programmes outlined. Um, notes the responses to those consultations which I've just outlined and agrees to delegate authority to the Executive Committee to consider and approve a response to the Scottish Government's Cleaner Air Scotland to draft air quality strategy consultation. That was a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> OK, uh, I think we've got a, a question from Councillor Shaw. Uh, thank you. Um, it's just with regards to item three. Um, obviously, anything that incorporates air quality um, also uh, speaks to low emission zones. And um, I believe uh, there is only one low emission zone incorporated into the Tatran area. Uh, it talks about the executive. Where will the um, Dundee City Council um, operation staff into that executive and the uh, the um, report that goes back to the Scottish Government, please. Well, can I? I mean, Mr. Speed can answer, but I mean, certainly, I will. I would certainly be looking for uh, as as the Dundee City Council representative on that executive. Uh, I'd certainly be looking for uh, briefing from from Dundee City Council officers on on that. Uh, Mr. Speed can maybe talk about uh, how how that will relate to to all the local uh, all the local authorities in the Tartan area. Yeah. And so perhaps a confirmation of who the executive committee is as well. That might be appropriate, please. Yeah. Okay. Well, if if I can prepare, um, Scott maybe can just prepare the the list of names for the executive committee while while, while I talk to you on, on this point. If that's okay, Councillor. Of course. Of course. Um, just, just to make sure I get it. <laughs> Absolutely right. <laughs> so, um, one of the things really, really important is that the whole of the board recognises that the work that, that that is carried out and is presented at this board isn't just carried out by Tactum staff. We have a great number of um, different groups regionally that we meet, where council officers, um, you know, they they very much. Uh, get involved in consultations and any of the work that we prepare, any major issue that needs to be discussed with all the local authority officers. We have groups, various groups to do that, like the, the, reg the regional transport liaison group, for example. Um, we also tie in a little wider than just the local authority as well. We very much are involved in what the Scots does at a national level. Um, we also um, involved in COSLA. 
So there's a great network of officers who are working behind the scenes to make sure that the voices of all the local authorities in Tatum Board are heard and that their opinions are sought. And then obviously we put together those reports or those documents or those responses to the consultations and then put them through to the board or to the executive committee to, to, to hear. There's a lot of work goes on from your officers um, that, that helps us pre uh, prepare the information that we provide. And the executive committee is um, Councillor Parrott, Councillor Thompson, uh, Councillor Parrott from Perth and Cross, Councillor Thompson from Stirling, Provost Proctor from Angus, uh, Heather Anderson, who's board member, and myself. Okay, um, so presumably, Richard, just confirmation that um, as well as transport colleagues, which is obviously uh, an incorporation of the air quality colleagues and uh, individuals like Tom Sterling and Jamie Landwehr, who is off the low emission zone. Yeah, can I maybe assist with the answer to that? Yeah, I'm happy for you to, yeah. to say that, Neil. Yeah, yeah just to say that um, we are, uh, TACTRAN are also represented on the Dundee LEZ group. So we are part of the steering group there. And um, so we do sort of, the, the recognition is that Dundee LEZ, although it is a Dundee project, it will have effect on the, the whole of the region because it's a regional centre. So we are very much aware of that. And the consultation response that we put back uh, on the cleaner air for Scotland, I'll certainly be making sure that that is put in, into that my, my knowledge from that group, but it will also be shared with members of that group, principally probably you and Gourley, I would think, but um, it will it will sort of take on board all that consideration. So, so there okay. certainly is a, an input in there. Okay, thank you, Neil. I do appreciate that. Um, and perhaps a, a discussion with the, the bridge manager yeah. as well with regards to that. Yeah, um, just a, a, an update on discussions with bridge manager. Uh, as you'll be aware, when we were looking at the park and right side at the south of the bridge, the steering group, which Fife Council was leading on, did involve the Taro bridge manager as well. So he is he is uh, involved with that. That work has sort of been uh, delayed because of lack of funding. However, we are looking at other possibilities to to take that forward. One being the STPR, as we spoke about earlier. The other one possibly being the bus partnership fund as well. So we are looking at that as possibilities. OK, thank you, Neil. I do appreciate that. And if you just obviously yeah. keep him in the loop, because he wasn't aware until I pointed out what was in today's minutes, what had happened. So thank you. OK, thank you. Um, yeah, we'll certainly take that on board. Um, Councillor McCready, we've got um, yeah. Walter Scott. Yeah. Walter, that's convenient. Yeah, it's just to, to mention is there's, there's a reference within the um, within the response to Scotland's road framework safety framework to 2030 uh, to the highway code. Um, I think it's on page 84. It was just to, to mention and, and put thanks to the uh, to colleagues um, across the Tactron board who provided uh, support to the, the Scots response and also assisted me with the Angus Council response to the Highway Code consultation which was submitted previously. Uh, so whilst Tactron itself didn't support or didn't actually submit a consultation response themselves, they were uh, they were involved and did contribute to those that were provided by others. Um, and ultimately when it comes to the feedback from that consultation, I'm sure that is something that the Tactron board would take an interest in and I'm, uh, I'm sure that uh, fellow officers will be reporting on that in due course. Thank you very much. Um, Paul Cronin, if you have a comment, please. Hi, uh, my comment was also on the road safety framework and just to ask the question if TACTRAM will be feeding in further to the consultations following the response. I reviewed the consultation offer in another capacity and probably considered the road safety framework to be light on strategic ambition and governance and still re remaining overly reactive to collisions, which is never going to address some of the more dangerous spots where people don't dare to go. OK, I mean, I mean, I think officers may want to come in, but I mean, I think obviously, you know, we, we'll see what comes out of the consultation, but I think we do need to, you know, I think it's certainly an issue that we need to keep on our agenda because clearly it's hugely important, particularly 
if we are trying to um, promote uh, active travel in particular, but also, you know, just in general, road safety is clearly hugely important. I don't know if any officers want to add yeah, to I, that. I could maybe come in on that again. Um, just to say there's that TACRAN does support uh, road safety in the main. It has in the past uh, has been uh, supporting the Safe Drive Stay Alive um, funding for that, uh, but we are also involved in the Tayside Road Safety Forum, which is uh, quite a number of different organisations from around Tayside that are involved with that. So any feedback that comes back from that yeah. consultation, we will pick it up through that. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I see uh, Ewan Gourley from Dundee City Council has put a, a, a comment in the chat about the good links between Dundee City Council and TACTA and regarding air quality. I think we'll, I think, uh, thanks to Councillor Short, we'll certainly be keeping a, an eye on that, make sure, it's, make, make sure that's the case. Um, anyone else got any uh, further comment or question on item eight? Chair, I have, a, I have one other comment to make just on the bus partnership fund. Sure. Uh, the bus partnership fund, uh, we have been informed by Transport Scotland that there will be an event on the 17th of February, which our members will be invited to. So it's really just to get it into your calendar as a save the date. And once we get more details and information on it, we'll certainly share that with you. Can we get that circulated to people just to yeah. uh, make sure that, that, that and, and as much, with as much detail as we could get at this point in time, but, but yeah, that's helpful, thanks. Okay, can we agree that report then? Yep, happy to take that as agreed. Can we then move on to item nine? And can I ask uh, Jonathan Padmore to take us through, this is going to be a, a kind of workshop and discussion, um, and hopefully hopefully, this this is kind of the the, the main business of the, of, of the meeting, to look at the new regional or to look at how we're going to develop the EU regional transport strategy. So, Jonathan, over to yourself. Thank you, Chair. Just try, try and find the right presentation to put on, on screen. Can I ask what presentation I've managed to that, put up? That, that's on screen, yep. Jonathan. <coughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks. So we've been chatting about writing a new regional transport strategy in, um, since the summer and yourselves, the, the partnership board, approved um, the, the proof search for the writing of a new regional transport strategy at the September board. Um, the first step is to prepare a main issues report with the intention um, to issue that for formal consultation um, early in, in 2021, um, probably Springish time. Um, we also want to make maximise the board's involvement in the process. So we have and we will continue to hold throughout the process workshop sessions and whatever means we can to, to get yourselves involved so you can shape the content of the report <laughs> and also so that we can draw on all your experience. The content of the main issues report is, is a there's six key elements to it, really. Um, and we, we've previously discussed at the September board the social, economic and environmental priorities with yourselves. And then we discussed them with uh, um, colleagues, um, officers in the council. Um, and we've also pulled together um, the nature of the region and also the travel demands of the region. Now, these are from um, st standard documents like the LDPs. Um, and so all of that kind of information is included as Appendix A. Um, so you're able to see just the, the headlines um, and it is it is just supposed to be headlines about um, the characteristics of a region, the social, economic and environmental priorities and the travel demands. Um, what we want to do today is to discuss the next two elements of the main issues report, i.e. the strengths and weaknesses of the transport network and, and also this issue, this uh, concept of scenario planning. And, and then finally, the, the next element of the, uh, the, the main issues report that we want to discuss with yourselves will be on the role of the regional transport strategy. And, and we, we want to come back to you in the new year um, to, to discuss that. Um, 
But as Neil's already highlighted in, in item seven, um, Transport Scotland are issuing a number of documents relating to both a national transport strategy delivery and also VSTPR, the strategic transport strategic transport projects review process. Um, there will be documents issued between um, December and mid-January on that, and and, it, and it's expected that those documents would inform um, the main issues report. So it's probably Hopefully it seems um, reasonable that, that we come back and have that discussion on the roles, the role of the RTS, where we can also bring you up to speed with all those items that National Tra that Transport Scotland are issuing on related topics and are very likely to inform the process. So in terms of in the first part of this workshop, is on the, um, the strengths and weaknesses of the um, of the existing transport networks. So, as I've as I've um, said, then what we've already done with yourselves and with council officers is to work um, highlight what the the economic, environmental, and social priorities um, are for for the region. And you'll also have noticed as we work through this process where we're continuing to structure the, the discussions around the four um, priority themes that have been identified in the national transport strategy i.e reducing inequalities taking climate action supporting inclusive economic growth and promoting health and well-being and we're doing that just to make sure that we hopefully we capture it we don't miss anything out but by following that broad framework we don't actually miss anything out so what we want to do in this first part um, this first workshop is to, as I say, understand what are the, um, the strengths and weaknesses of the transport network in terms of supporting these themes. Um, so, in terms of in terms of reducing inequalities, the ability of a transport network to enable access to local facilities, and also the ability of a transport network to be inclusive, enabling everyone to travel. And in terms of taking climate action or responding to climate change, it's how resilient is our transport network to adverse weather, and does it actually enable us to to travel sustainably? Sustainably. In terms of in supporting inclusive economic growth, it's about understanding where those pinch points are which affect journey time and reliability. It's about get um, does it, the transport network help us get people to jobs? It's about um, connecting tax transit cities don't both to each other but also connecting the whole region to the, to the rest of Scotland as well and a, a fourth theme we've got in there is does it support tourism um, finally um, in terms of promoting health and well-being is the transport network safe does it reduce, help reduce pollution does it enable access to health facilities and does it enable active travel so what I'll do I'll work there's four slides now which go which delve into those um, four themes in a bit more detail. I'll go through those four slides just which are highlighting what ourselves and the council officers um, have have highlighted uh, as as strengths and weaknesses in the transport network and then I'll come back to, to each slide in turn and we'll spend up to five minutes um, seeing if a if there's anything that we've missed out from there. So in terms of whether our transport networks help us reduce inequalities, then some of the weaknesses that we've identified are the, the limited public transport in, in rural areas, the cost of travel and the impact that has on, on transport poverty, the, the networks, the fact that networks aren't inclusive for people with mobility difficulties. But on the other hand, um, in terms of strengths, then Particularly in Dundee City, there is a good public transport network. I appreciate that um, it's uh, it's declining, but uh, there, there is still a reasonably good public transport network there. We've also got good community and demand responsive networks um, across across the region, and actually, quite uniquely for Scotland, we're, we're relatively well placed in terms of future technology and mass with um, 
having a couple of mass platforms um, that we can that we can use to support um, our objectives in the future. In terms of our transport networks, helping uh, helping us take climate action or respond to climate change. Um, some of the weaknesses are the, the extent and quality of the pedestrian and cycle environments, um, the, the amount of EV structure that we've got at the moment, and, and there's, there's plenty of plenty, actually there's not too many, but there's, there are significant um, weak points um, in our <coughs> networks in terms of resilience to, to adverse weather, both our, our roads and, and rail. But in terms of the strengths and the opportunities, um, of of being able to respond or to, to respond to to or sorry to take climate action, then some of these strengths are the compact towns and cities we've got, which in, enable plenty of walking and cycling for short trips. Um, in different parts of our region, plenty of our settlements are relatively close, i.e., cycling distance close. Um, and, and we've also got opportunities that some of this, the city deals um, bring to us as, uh, as well. In terms of our networks being able to helping us promote inclusive economic growth, then things you'll be well tuned into. There are obviously pinch points across the whole of, uh, of the region, which will affect journey time and reliability. Um, but there's also weak points in term, particularly in terms of um, the rail trip between um, Perth and, uh, and Edinburgh, and also access in, in, into, into Montrose as well, particularly for the port of Montrose, obviously. Um, strengths, strengths of the region in terms of promoting inclusive economic growth. Most, if not all our major towns and cities are well connected on the strategic um, road and rail networks. We've got, we've got ports, Port of Montrose, we've got the <laughs> airport. Um, and another thing that we've identified is the limited corridor, uh, because these aren't the biggest cities in the world, we've got limited corridors into um, these cities, which makes them quite suited for solutions like park and ride. And then finally, and I'll shoot back to the first slide again after this, is in terms of um, how does our how do our networks help us promote health and well-being? Some of the weaknesses are currently poor active travel network, poor active travel, poor active travel connectivity between settlements, um, pinch points in our cities um, creating congestion and air quality problems, um, and just traffic volumes creating air quality problems as well. Um, and there's obviously road safety issues in, in various places. Um, but again, the strengths, the opportunities, compact cities, settlements within cycling distance of, of each other, uh, and funding coming in through the active city region deals. So that was a, these are the headline thoughts from the um, council and of the strengths and weaknesses of a, of a transport network. I'll flick back to the first one. And if on each of these, we've, we've probably got about five minutes. If you, if there's any gaps um, that you think that we've missed out, any clearing gaps, then then please just shout out and and we'll roll on from slide to slide. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Uh, if you have any question, any comment, really, it's not about questions. Well, we can ask questions, but it's about comments and. Um, so, anybody got anything they want to say on this uh, first slide about inequalities? Um, Richard, sorry, yes. I don't see, I don't see anything about cost factors um, with regards to the inequalities um, in Dundee. That's fine. Yeah, we'll put it across all four. Please, yeah. if you don't mind. Yeah, very much so. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, Chair, in, in, in Stirling, we're, we're doing a lot of work on dementia at the moment. Uh, I think that's an area you might want to include. OK, thank you. Uh, Chair, one of the points in Angus, a lot of the smaller towns 
uh, you know, they're not really suitable for cycle lanes or, uh, you, you know, because of the wee na narrow streets and, and quite narrow pavements. Uh, this kind of inhibits uh, people, you know, using the cycling within the town. OK, outside, going out into the rural areas, but actually within the towns, something's going to be quite difficult. Anyone else got anything on any qualities? Um, and could I skip? Oh, sorry. Do you want to go? Um, this is Heather Anderson, so I can't yeah. see. I'm Diane, so I can't really see what anybody else can see. Um, but I just had a question, actually. Sorry, not a comment. Um, but it is related to the inequality section, and also the suppose of the sort of conducting the scenario planning. So just based on my experience of scenario mapping, um, it's, it's normally involved sort of public engagement with the scenario mapping as users um, to get users sort of insight. And I guess as well under inequalities, um, just linking in with the Theory of Scottish Action Plan, which also involves a lot of community engagement and uh, promotes or advocates for community engagement. So I just wondered if there was any plan to, to do that as well for, for this, or um, I guess you'll be taking into account things from the recent surveys that have, been done, that have been done, but anything beyond that or anything like that? Thanks. Councillor McCready, could I come in there? Is that OK? Sure. Yeah, so this is part of the process. Um, first of all, we wanted to bring you the initial findings of um, the conversations that we've had with, um, with various officers uh, and groups to bring this. Um, what we'll be looking to do is bring the full draft issues report back to the board in March. We're also along with a consultation plan, which will be um, outlining all the different groups, all the different community partnerships, all the different um, organisations that we will be looking to engage with to ensure that we hear from the wider, from the wider world. Um, between now and March, I'd be more than happy to put in um, a few workshop workshop sessions um, for members of the board to attend if they if they wanted to to have further discussion on some of these issues to get into a bit more of a one-to-one -one conversation with officers if you like so yeah this is the start of the well, it's not the start of the process but there is a a clear pathway through till march when we come back with the full draft issues report and a consultation outline okay thank you <coughs> Hello, it's, um, it's, it's member Amy McDonald. I just wanted yeah. to ask yeah. under equalities, we talk about as a strength the fact that we have good public transport, ne transport networks during the day. There are people that work shifts that are perhaps reliant on public transport. Um, by, by return, are we saying that, that it's a weakness that we do not have good public transport links out with kind of the nine to five commuter times? And is that something that we need to address? Yes, fundamentally, um, and it might help if we make that um, comment a, a bit more explicit. Yeah. I think also because of the major changes that are happening across the network um, in January, um, the transport network is very much changing. Uh, we also are very um, car poor in the city of Dundee, um, so that is a, an inequality as well, the, the, the lack of uh, cars, so the reliance on a good public transport network, and that is um, that's changing. OK, um, I've got comments from Councillor Mark McDonald. Thank you, Chair. Um, just based on the the um, agenda pack that we had about what our priorities for reducing inequalities, I noticed in the Angus section it, it details the areas of the greatest deprivation in terms of the transport availability, though, that's an area that's quite well served, whereas the other settlements in and around Angus are actually the ones where folk that maybe don't have access to cars, which is a vital transport thing in Angus um, at the moment, um, they've got the greater difficulties, um, whereas that specific location that's highlighted in the report isn't, isn't it, in my view, wouldn't necessarily be a focus because five minutes walk to the train station, five minutes walk to the bus stop, you know, they've got access to um, travel options, whereas the other Angus settlements don't. So it's just something that that I think is worth, worth noting. 
it's a, it's, it's a good point and it, it's true of most of our uh, bigger settlements uh, as well. Some of the poorer areas are actually um, in a relatively good position in terms of accessibility, um, proximity to services, as well as the kind of public transport services that, that might be close in hand. Hopefully, um, by the time that we produce the, one, one of the things that's missing from this conversation at the moment, and by the time that we produce the, uh, the main issues report, it'll be a, <laughs> very complicated, there'll be a flow chart um, which links the evidence bases with the problems, with um, the priorities uh, and objectives. And, and so, yes, at the moment, um, we've highlighted in the evidence base where there are areas of, uh, uh, of deprivation, but that's not that's, they don't necessarily have access problems in, in, those, in those locations. I should, should also um, highlight that um, in terms of the Scottish indices of multiple depriva deprivation, we are able to compare and contrast the, the areas that are overall um, in the lowest brackets for multiple deprivation and separate out that separate them out from areas that um, are are in them um, classified as areas of multiple deprivation because of accessibility. So we are able to separate that kind of that kind of data out as well. Thanks. I've got three more uh, people wanting to comment on this one. I think so. Uh, I'll, I'll call those three and then I think we'll we'll, we'll move on. But I think. There's a general thing that if you have, if anything occurs to you out with the meeting or you don't get the chance to see it, I think you can still pass that in. So uh, pass that on to Jonathan or, or to or to Mark. Um, so uh, yeah, or, or to their own yeah, or to their own officers, Council McCready as well. Sure. The, the officers are well well engaged in this. Councillor yeah. Parrott. Thanks very much, Chair. I, I note here it's a headline enabling access to local facilities, but certainly from a, a Perth and Kinross perspective, one, one of the big difficulties in, in, in the rural areas is, is access to healthcare provision. And, and I just wonder whether that might be given, if you like, um, a specific mention in, in, in this area rather than, rather than a, if you like, generic mention. Um, it, it, it is such an important issue for us. Yeah. I think that's important because it, I mean, if I can abuse my position as the chair and say as the councillor for Nine Wells Hospital, um, the, 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 the fact that everybody has to go, to, well not everybody, but you know the fact that more and more people have to go to Nine Wells it causes issues for the, the quality of life for people in my ward, um, you know, so I think that and you know for the people that are going there as well. I, 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 I see it's mention, mentioned under the health and well-being specifically, yeah. so, so that's good, yeah. yeah. Um, councillor Rome. Thank you, Chair. And just the last one, I suppose, under um, inclusivity of people with multi difficulties, just about um, feeding back to our bus partnerships about having sufficient spaces within bus and sufficient regularity for areas that we know where there are more people uh, that need help that have mobility difficulties. Uh, assisted living, for example, we, we'll know that there are strict aids when it exists and um, homes for assisted living, as I say. So can we have those conversations to make sure that the buses are aware that they're providing a sufficient service for those areas? Apologies, councillor. Um, it was a, not, not a perfect line there. I, I only caught about half of it, but I, I think um, what you're asking is to, is to make sure that um, we get whatever information that we have on um, accessibility issues for people with mobility difficulties and share that with our, uh, with our the bus operators across the region? Uh, yes, roughly that, just to make sure that the, there's sufficient provision and access for people um, using mobility scooters, for example. There are sufficient spaces on the buses that serve those routes and they're taking that into account when um, designing those routes for the future. Somebody else might want to um, could, could, I, could, I, could I maybe come in there if that's all right, um, Councillor McCready? Um, Councillor Room, um, public transport is going to be one of the biggest challenges I think that the transport sector is going to be looking at in Scotland over the next 12 months. As you're well aware, they've been under huge financial pressure, um, being supported by the, the public purse just to keep um, access to 
people getting to work or getting to the, the, the other facilities that they need. Um, provision was made in the 2019 Transport Act for local authorities to look at how public transport provision is made within their areas. Um, and I know that there's more work going to be done with Transport Scotland uh, over the next coming months, putting some meat on the bones around what that actually means, what the legislation is going to actually look like. So I think this is going to be, yes, in, in short, yes, we will take on board what you've said, but also I think there's going to be a lot more work for councillors and for officers to do over the next 12 months around public transport. I think it's going to be a really hot topic. And we'll we'll endeavour to bring as much information as possible to your attention um, through the meetings like this and through papers and through your offices as well. No, that, that's a very useful response. Thank you. Obviously, we've just gone through a very major route change consultation locally, but and these things evolve all the time. And as you say, it's a difficult time. So just make sure that you know we're still engaged with. Yeah, this system is incredibly volatile at the moment. Yep, yeah, and thank you. Okay, Dr. Berg, you got a comment? Yes, so first of all, the first half of my question has been covered in terms of healthcare access, which I think is really, really important as part of this policy. I can definitely see gaps both for actually people getting to hospital for treatment, but also actually for people who commute uh, to hospitals, and it can take a very long time to get from some bits of Angus, particularly to uh, nine wells uh, if you're going to use public transport. The second was to ask a slightly higher level question in terms of evidence base. I suppose I'm not quite sure where that fits in. You know, will there be work that needs to be commissioned to work out the evidence base that informs the transport policy? Or is there a feeling that that information is already in place and can be used to base these decisions and policy documents on. Jonathan, um, you, you may be aware you may be aware that we um, have been doing a lot of work with particularly with NHS Tayside over the last couple of years and um, we've got um, we built up plenty of evidence bases in terms of people's ability to both staff and visitors uh, and, and patients to to access the health facilities across um, across Tayside. Um, we have built up those extremely good evidence bases. What what value we will need to we will we will obviously need to revisit them when um, stuff returns to normal. Um, we don't exactly know um, what our public transport net, networks are going to look like next year. Um, I suppose the greatest value of those, of those evidence is evidence bases at the moment are those areas highlighting those areas that have problems at the moment and they will have even greater problems in the future. Uh, I guess because of the changes that that may occur next year, what we then don't know is whether new areas have come into come into play and there will be new areas that, that experience problems. But because we have been doing a lot of work with NHS Tayside over the last um, over the last year and a half or so. Um, then we've got pretty good, as good evidence bases as we can ha can at this point in time. But that's not to say they're going to be perfect, given the changes in the public transport networks. Thank you. Could I could I just quickly come in there? Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah. So Jonathan. Um, just to reiterate what I was saying is that there's part of the process where we'll where we will be um, engaging even more closely with different organizations and partners in the region um, and we will pull in any evidence and data that we can through those discussions to highlight what the biggest issues are. And I think that's something about this whole process is to get to the priorities of what what we are actually going to you know lobby if we need to lobby uh, for funding to come into certain areas, um, to bid for funding where there is funding available, and to make sure that actually the plan that we have is very focused and deliverable. Um, so those conversations are going to be ongoing. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, can could, I suggest? Um, Amy McDonald, could I just come in briefly, please? Sure. Um, just in terms of um, Mark, in your director's report, the, the spaces for people 
um, survey that had been carried out, it was quite clear, I felt, from the results there, and apologies I couldn't come in. I've been struggling with my technology this morning that there are kind of two, there are two pools of people, and it reflects on the, the public transport for hospitals that where people can drive and where people can make their own way, they seem to be more content with the transport infrastructure. Whereas where people are relying on public transport, they are less satisfied. So from that perspective and looking at where we identify our weaknesses, there's definitely something coming through there for me that, that people that are that are need to use public transport aren't satisfied with the provision just now. The surveys didn't go into the detail necessarily of, of why that is, but should we be recognising that as a potential weakness, particularly as we move forward with a review of public transport and a rationalisation of where funding can be applied, that there maybe is a need for, for, more, for a greater understanding in that area to properly bottom out what the concerns for, for people and particularly across which transport types are, are necessarily being, um, being highlighted as being people having discontentment with them. Yeah, if I, if I can come in there. Um... Yes, absolutely. We are picking up the information from that and from the survey that we are doing. Uh, Jonathan, correct me if I'm wrong, but actually the work around the space of people survey is looking, we are looking to continue that beyond the um, sort of, you know, in, into next financial year, uh, into April. Hopefully people will be starting to get back to normal around that point. So we're actually going to be looking at what changes of attitudes come when once people are vaccinated, maybe feel a little bit safer are using various forms of transport, but it's not the only um, piece of work that's um, that's been done around consultation. Transport Scotland are doing um, various uh, questionnaires out to people, gauging people's moods, collecting a huge amount of data on how people feel about using different forms of transport, how safe they feel, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's one of many um, data sources and particularly questionnaires that we will be uh, looking at. Yeah, there's there's probably about four major sources of of surveys that have been conducted um, during the last few months to try and understand people's um, attitudes, and, and they, they produce reports every few few months. And at some point in time in this process, but that is something that we we really need to get our heads around, um, un understanding what is coming out of, of all those different satisfaction and attitude reports and, and it does play heavily into the, into the next part of, of the workshop as well but it is an important thing to there's, there's a lot been a lot of data collected on it this year and it is going to be very helpful and useful in understanding um, what we need to do with our transport networks. Okay thanks Jonathan can I suggest we move on and bear in mind what I've said that if you if there's any burning issues you haven't raised you know please feel free to uh, to pass them back, Jonathan. The, the, the second slide um, was about the strengths and weaknesses of the transport network in terms of taking climate action or responding to, to climate change. Uh, and the, uh, some of the weaknesses that we've had identified there are the extent and quality of a um, public, the pedestrian and cycle environments, EV, the extent of EV and hydrogen infrastructure, um, flooding issues, um, but then in terms of strengths, the compact nature of our, of our towns and cities, not forgetting what, what um, Provost Proctor said that, you know, in some of our old towns, they're, they're, you know, there's limited space. <laughs> that is fundamentally the job that, 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 that we've got, is limited space from one end of a highway, from one side of the highway to the other side, and we've got to squeeze lots of different functions in there. Um, uh, and Provis Pops has highlighted that. Um, okay. So there's some of the strengths and weaknesses that we've thrown up there. So anyone got any uh, comments on that? If you want to put it, put it into the chat, if you want to see something. Um, Councillor Short. Um, 
I know it's a slogan, but the solution to pollution is getting on the bus and take 75 cars off the road if you've got 75 people on the bus. However, it's very difficult to retrofit for a lot of the areas that we're talking about, uh, bus lanes and bus gates. Um, so presumably that needs to be something that needs to go in because uh, I think that's a, that is a huge problem. And, uh, you know, somewhere like the Lockheed Road, if we could put a bus, a bus gate on that, it would be uh, it would be amazing. So uh, because we don't have that facility, we then need to look to alternatives like uh, park and choose. Yep. Uh, uh, Councillor Parrott. Yes, thank you, Raj. Um, I, I'm just wondering whether a, num a number of things can be taken up un under this heading, and that is um, that my, my first would be, if you like, um, greater use of our, our ports, Perth, Dundee, um, Montrose, um, for um, you know, short sea freight taking vehicles off roads. Um, my second point would be, can we incorporate into this further electrification of the rail network? Um, north of um, Dunblane and my third comment here would be again the business of road transit freight. Um, can we do anything from our perspective to encourage more of that transit freight to be carried by rail um, and, and in that context I continue to be a supporter of the new freight terminal at Blackford for Highland Spring, which may attract other users, and, and I just wonder whether there are other opportunities of that ilk um, in in our region. Thank you. OK, uh, Dr Berg. Uh, I was just wondering, something I haven't seen here is, for example, actually the quality of buses that we have on our roads, and um, whether that's something that should be incorporated. And also, for example, you know, electric buses, great if you can manage that. Hydrogen buses, fantastic. And buses with cycle racks so that people can jump large sections of road and then you know, use cycles on the other side. So that's just you know, a personal thing that yeah. has, where that will fit in. Jonathan, you want to uh, respond to some of those? Yes, thanks. Um, in terms of Councillor Parrott's comments, I, I think some of them are based on opportunities that our network currently presents and some of them um, will be things that we we'll want to highlight in terms of options to how to address these problems. Um, there's a very fine line between identifying opportunities here and identifying options that we, that we want to throw in the mix later as well. Um, so, so some will fall into one bucket and some will fall into, into the other. Um, yeah. The, uh, the quality of services, not just buses. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's probably something to reflect. Um, it, it does affect people's behaviour, obviously. Um, and I think there's another point that, that Jonathan raised there. Um, I think I'd probably wrap up under the integration um, that in terms of achieving some of this stuff, one of the weaknesses is the um, the integrated nature of some of our networks and obviously the particular example that Jonathan threw up there was um, buses and, and being able to carry bikes on buses. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll reflect those comments somehow. If I could just make a very quick comment on that as well, just going back to what I was saying, I think this is going to be a very focused year on public transport. Um, certainly in terms of the investment into um, cleaner technology fleets, um, it's going to be interesting. I think it's going to be a little bit disappointing, if I'm honest, about what the private companies feel they can now invest, um, having had the year that they have had. Um, and I think it's going to be, um, you know, for the Scottish Government, for the Regional Transport Partnerships, local authorities to come together under that new legislation um, to really try and push the boundaries and to look at how this is going to be funded. I think it's going to be a real big, really big challenge. OK, um, uh, what, uh, Jonathan. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, apolo apologies, Council Councillor Short. Um, yeah, it, it's I think it's the same um, comment that uh, uh, Provis Proctor to, to raise. You, you're right and we need to reflect it in there that um, at the physical nature of our towns and cities don't necessarily enable us to put in what we want to put in. Um, so that is definitely a point that needs to be reflected in, in there. Okay, uh, 
Yeah, and I think there's also an issue. I think Councillor Short may well have been at this meeting. Um, was it a meeting with Transport Scotland in, in Dundee House where they were telling us about uh, physical things to promote buses and they showed us uh, the M8 just at Townhead in Glasgow where there are 10 lanes of traffic um, and suggested that you could make bus lanes. But, you know, I mean, you know, the city fathers in Glasgow may have made a mistake in some respects of knocking down large parts of the city. Um, and I know Dundee did knock down large parts of the city, but don't think we're, we're up for doing it again, really. Um, so, um, you know, I think that you know, we need to look at different ways of doing things. So I think, but I think that's quite well made. I don't think anybody else has got a comment on this one at this point. Um, so you want to move on, Jonathan, I think. Uh, the, the next slide was about um, what are the strengths and weaknesses in terms of helping us promote inclusive economic growth. Um, we, flag we flagged up uh, with the council officers some of those pinch points and some of the areas where, in terms of weaknesses, we, we flagged up some of those key pinch points on the strategic networks um, and also some of the, the, the weak links in our strategic networks. Um, and then we've also flagged up some of the, um, the strengths and clearly they were well, not clearly. I'd suggest that the, the key strength um, in terms of promoting inclusive economic growth is is the location of the region and the and the and the, the fact that uh, most of our major towns and cities are well located to the strategic road and rail networks. Okay, anyone got any comments on that? That's a huge amount. I mean, I think this could be included in all of the stuff, but I mean, I suppose my comment on this is, you know, how do we adapt for the new normal? Because if, you know, if there are fewer folk using the using using uh, trains, for example, how do we make sure that there's still a decent train service there? You know, that that might not make sense commercially, it's similar to buses. You know, if people are, you know, if sitting at your desk talking to your computer is going to be the new normal. Um, you know what's the you know how 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 are we how are we going to factor that and we probably have to factor it into just about everything but you know how do we factor that and I suppose would be my uh, would be my question. Um, anyone else? I mean, people are putting comments in the in the chat. I mean, I think it was we are noting those or we're capturing those, aren't we? Yeah. We we we'll 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 capture those comments. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't think anybody is anybody wanting to. Uh, I'm just nodding at all three comments. Yeah, I think they're important. Yeah. Okay, we're we happy to move on to the next slide then. And the final slide of, of part one of the um, uh, of a workshop is um, the extent to which our strengths and weaknesses in our networks in terms of helping us promote health and well-being. Um, we have highlighted um, the importance um, that both Councillor Parrott and Jonathan Burke have highlighted the important importance of the access to health. But um, some of his weaknesses in terms of uh, of how the networks promote health and well-being it is poor active travel links in some places, um, traffic and pinch points creating air and noise problems, um, road safety problems. Um, but also, we probably <coughs> have got there are some strengths in terms of our compact cities and the, um, the proximity of some of our uh, of our settlements as well to each other. OK, if you want to make a comment on this, can you please indicate, but uh, Councillor Shaw. Thank you. Um, one of the things that prevents um, some people from choosing active travel, especially in tenemental wards like uh, myself and Councillor McCready have, is the fact that they don't want to hike a bike up five stairs of tenemental flats and also they don't want to leave it um, outside. 
Um, so investment in infrastructure uh, is so incredibly important. Um, I mean, we made way for Euro bins to help with the climate, so presumably we can take away car parking spaces and create um, bike storage, which is safe, convenient. I noticed in the report today that there was, um, I think it was 15 or 16 thousand pounds went to the university um, to support them being able to use that and um, all for that. But I think we have to go wider than just the, the university cohort and it needs to be um, us a generation that took car finance as opposed to taking to a bike that we need to we need to do the modal shift with that, uh, that cohort rather than the younger people coming through. So I think there is, needs to be uh, an investment in that area to promote health and well-being, please. Yeah, I, I need to expand that problem out from just active travel routes to, to active travel infrastructure. Yeah. <coughs> Anyone else got any points on this slide? Yeah, Chair, Chair can I just uh, uh, thank you, make, make a point again. We're talking about connectivity with the rural areas and we're talking about the quality of air, um, use of electric vehicles. Again, I just stress the requirement for maybe uh, charging points in the uh, local areas. I give an example, the car park at Glendall, which is used by people from out with Angus, Angus sound out with very busy uh, in, in, in the summertime uh, and other places. And I think that we should be considering sort of charging points for, um, you know, electric vehicles. Um, that's part of the infrastructures we, we should be considering. Yeah, thanks. OK, anybody else got a point on this one? Jonathan, want to move on then, I think? <clears throat> so the second part. Uh, sorry, of sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Jonathan. Uh, sorry, um, Council Creedy. There's a lot of information being thrown at um, at the board. There, um, I'd just like to reiterate and just get an indication. Would the board find it helpful if we put in maybe two non-mandatory workshop sessions where people can pop in and pop out? Uh, where we'll make the officers available if they want to talk through um, this in, in more detail uh, as we progress through because there's an awful lot to get through and a lot of voices that we want to hear so I, I just thought it might be just like as we're going into the next um, the next sort of workshop if you like I'm just well aware of the time and what Jonathan wants to cover in this so I just thought it was a, 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 an opportunity to ask the board if they would find that useful and helpful to have just drop in where they can drop in and out as they want into those sessions? Well, I think it certainly looks like it. I think well, I'm, I'm taking the two responses. Somebody was so excited there was bagpipes. I think that was, Chris, I think that was, uh, that was Black Watch. I think that was Provis Proctor. Um, yes. uh, we, we, We'll we'll put a couple of um, sessions in where the board members can come along if if, if they so choose to do so. Um, apologies, Jonathan, for for that interruption. That's okay, uh, and obviously we'll get the um, uh, an updated presentation summarising um, your, your comments back out to you uh, as well. The um, the second part of, of the exercise, the second part of the workshop is on scenario mapping. It's not a term I'm overly um, uh, keen on, it's what Transport Scotland use, um, but it's just about uncertainties. Um, so you'll be aware there are many uncertainties about the future which will shape why, where, how, how much and how we travel, not least technology and worldwide events like climate change. Um, but the regional transport strategy considers how best to meet travel demands over a 20 year time period. Uh, this 20 year time period to align with our, our land use planning processes. Um, so we do need what to consider what are the uncertainties of travel demand and supply that we need to take into account over this time period and beyond. And we also need to recognise that this is a constantly changing thing. Um, and there's plenty of stuff that we can do today, which I'm sure most of us um, would not have thought we were able to do even only a couple of years ago. So how do we how do we respond to this ever changing um, situation? Um, I think there's two main I'd suggest there's two main ways. Uh, one, we, 
we continue to have regular reviews of the trends and programmes to, to ensure that the strategy remains relevant and responsive. Um, but secondly, there's this exercise of scenario mapping, which, which we can undertake now um, and at other stages in the process, but fundamentally now, to, which helps us in highlight the potential uncertainties and their likely impact. And this will help inform our policies and programmes. Um, it, it's about whether or not we feel that we need to help promote a scenario or whether or not we feel that we need to mitigate against a scenario as as an example. Uh, suggesting that there's three stages um, to go through this to go through this piece of work, but uh, today just want to go through that first stage, uh, which is identifying the uncertainties in travel demand and supply. When we've got a good idea of, of some of those uncertainties, then officers of the council and, and TATRAN will go away and consider the potential impact of uncertainties and also consider the likelihood of those uncertainties. Um, I think for any one uncertainty there'll be plenty of potential impacts. Um, you'll see it's called scenario planning but you'll see that it's no different to the, um, the risk management processes that, that we follow all the time. What's the risk? What's the impact of a risk? What's the likelihood of a risk? So I know it's I know Transport Scotland has called, called it scenario planning, or mapping, but uh, it's it's just another risk management process, which is quite right and proper to follow. Um, to help guide the conversation, we've suggested that there are four types of uncertainty, um, and have suggested some headings underneath these: um, political and global triggers, technology and the future of transport provision. Um, policy uh, and attitudes too. Um, much like the last um, session, then I'll talk, we've got a bit more detail on four subsequent slides and we'll talk through those, I'll go through those quickly and then we can come back and spend five minutes or so uh, on each slide um, just to just to understand whether there's any gaps um, that, that, that we need to fill in terms of understanding what some of those uncertainties of, of supply and demand are. Um, I will say some quick pointers though. Don't worry about scenario, disaster scenarios like war or meteors hitting, something of that scale, then we all just recalibrate to be able to get on with it anyway. Um, and also don't worry, don't, don't worry overly about which category any uncertainty falls into. Um, you'll probably appreciate there are there are strong links between all these categories and, and issues can fall into more than one. As a very crude guide, I would say that those political and global triggers and also technology, um, they then probably inform policy and attitudes. So there's relationships between all these types of, of groupings and, and at this stage, I would encourage you just to shout out rather than worry too much about which which bracket any of these things come, come into. And, and, and the, the other thing um, is is not to debate. We're not. There's no wrong answers. It, it's and it's not to debate the likelihood of anything at this stage. And um, as it's been topical for the last four years, and it's ne it's continues to remain topical. There's probably no better example than Brexit. It's not about pros or cons. It's about understanding what the breadth of uncertainties are. So, in terms of the uncertainties of of travel demand and supply, and in, I think in terms of the political and global triggers that that, that create uncertainties. And um, then we've suggested that climate change is a heading which produces bit, plenty of uncertainties, particularly in terms of network resilience. And again, also um, uh, topically, um, the policy responses um, from governments um, and, uh, and responses from, from, from the major um, companies as well, the, the international multi-global companies. Um, economic booms and busts are also a um, a, a key trigger. Um, uh, for example, they, uh, they they affect not only the activity 
um, the trip generation in the region from house building and, and general economic activity. But I think a, a good example is also, particularly for ourselves, what happens in Aberdeen strongly affects what happens at the pinch points in the Tatran region. The amount of traffic going through um, the Tatran um, region uh, is, is impacted on by the, um, the, the strength of Aberdeen. And then there's, as I say, there's various um, uh, scenarios, unknowns re relating to Brexit, and it's just about understanding what that breadth of potential impacts are. Um, in terms of technology and the future of transport, then technology can provide us with tools to help us achieve our objectives, like reducing emissions for electric and hydrogen vehicles. Uh, it, can, it can help us deliver all of our favourite thing, which is road pricing. Um, <laughs> Apologies for my sarcasm, and, um, and obviously it's it's helping us provide solutions such as uh, such as mass. Um, but they, it also affects um, how we travel as as well. Um, we're all predicting driverless cars at some point in time, but what impact will that have in terms of, of road capacity uh, and and deliveries uh, as well? How will deliveries be made in, in the future? Um, subject to what technological um, solutions exist. And, and again, that just affects the amount of uh, space we need to, or the networks that, what the networks need to provide. Um, I think we've already touched on the, um, the uncertainties about the future of, of our public transport networks, particularly the funding behind them, um, or the sustainability, I should say. Um, and, you know, a key, under, a key, um, element of uncertainty is the cost of energy and travel. How that travel, how that changes through time as we move from carbon to, to, to green energy sources. As, as I hinted at rather crudely that I think the, the, those global uh, those global and political triggers um, as well as technology then will influence government and local policy and this is part of why we're doing all this to to understand what we want to promote more or what we need to mitigate against um, and so and there's uncertainties in terms of of transport policy in terms of going forward as, as the priority prioritization of modes and funding um, land use policies where will there be a demand for housing and what will be the role of our ten, town centers and, and um, Apologies, also coming back to road pricing again. Um, fiscal policies. Um, what kind of fiscal policies may arise from some of those um, environmental or 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 or, 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 or transport policies that exist, um, and not least the, the loss of fuel duties um, that uh, that that will occur in the future fuel from carbon sources, obviously. And now all of these things will then affect people's attitudes. Um, uh, we've all talked plenty, and, and again, we touched on it today, about the uh, how situations like the current pandemic um, is affecting attitudes to travel now, and whether or not that will continue in the future. Uh, the, the public's attitude to climate change continues to evolve. Um, again, something else which touches on a, a point that Councillor Short raised earlier, are people's attitudes to ownership changing? I, are, they, are they happier? Um, will, will there be future generations which are happier sh having shared mobility options rather than um, owning, owning cars? Uncertainties. And, and then um, probably for one that affects all of us um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, technology provides obviously plenty of opportunities for how we live our lives, um, how we work working at home, shopping online, increasing the flexibility of where we live. Maybe we don't need to walk um, 200 metres to, to the factory, do we? Um, but will we? So apologies, that's, they are very broad headings. Uh, just to try and capture some of those key um, 
uncertainties of travel demand and supply. And there, I'm sure there will be plenty of stuff hidden underneath those, of those headings. But um, if we can go back to the first one and then again, spend five minutes or so on, on each one and um, please just shout out um, any uncertainties that you think have been missed out or aren't clear and the broad headings. So there's probably mm -hmm. plenty of stuff which won't be clear. Okay, I think it's a lot of comments. Thank you for the helpful in the chat. But um, anyone got any, anyone, anyone want to say on, on, on this one? I was just, um, it's Amy McDonald. I'm yeah. just wondering when we when we talk about uncertainties, we've, we've talked very generally about uncertainties and I wondered if it might be um, good to understand them in a little bit more detail, perhaps looking at the uncertainties which we expect in the short, medium and long term. Then looking at what can be controlled and what we can manage. Some of these climate change, for example, it is something we can only manage, we cannot control. So I think maybe a little bit more structure around that might help inform the, the consideration of uncertainties as we develop the different phases in the strategy going forward. Um, I think there's a lot in this area and we perhaps need to chunk it down a little bit more to get a better understanding of how we deal with these issues. Okay, anyone else? <coughs> just to, just to yeah, respond to that. Uh, if I could just say, and Sorry. I mentioned in the last uh, meeting we had, uh, my little book, Demand Responsive Transport Services Towards the Flexible Mobility uh, Approach. And this was written uh, in 2004. It covers just everything that what Jonathan has basically said. Um, a, a, a good book and a uh, Anyone want to have a look at it? Quite happy to share it. Thanks a lot. Jonathan? Uh, yes, thank you, Councillor. Uh, sorry, thank you, Provost Proctor, for that uh, offer, and, and we will we'll read, we'll read the book. Um, I, I just wanted to also respond to, to Amy. Um, I, I agree 100%. Um, just didn't want to throw too much stuff at you in, in this one session. You, you're right. As we, as we've got alpha, this is about starting off with just that high level list, and then you're quite right. We need to break it down into the types of impacts, and then understand whether they are short, medium, or long term, and then understanding what level of influence that we have over them. So you're quite right. These are all the, the kind of things that we need to introduce into the process, and we'll be talking yourselves through. But apologies, just didn't want to um, throw all of that at, at everyone today. Um, anyone else? I'm not seeing anyone else, so maybe move on, Jonathan. Technology and the future of transport provision. Um, got any comments on on those? Mm -hmm. Is that somebody trying sorry, to? I don't know if you... Yep, sorry, it's Heather Anderson. Yeah, um, so I was just like laying on meeting myself. Is it OK to go? Or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, OK. Um, so this was just, it, it actually sort of relates to every category, I think. And I'm not sure that there's a control or, um, I don't think it can necessarily be controlled or managed, but I think it's still possibly important to consider it. Um, and I guess that's social change. So social change are then, uh, arises from political or global events, so whether that's an <sighs> increase in um, inequality or, but specifically relating to, to technology, I suppose that there might be a shift in, um, like a further shift in, in sort of social access to transport. So perhaps when perhaps there's, a, there's people who can afford a polluting, a cheap polluting car right now, but maybe won't be able to afford an electric or hydrogen vehicle when that is our only option. Um, <coughs> and I just wonder if that affects the demographic of the user of public transport in the future and what, what impact that might have on the viability or, um, or yeah, knock on effect on, I guess, any other aspect of transport. So I just think social change has it necessarily been captured explicitly here? And maybe, perhaps it should be. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else on this one? Yeah, I guess that social change, generational change, it's sort of the same sort of idea that um, we had to take into account. Uh, we're going in a, in a in a direction of under 19s having um, access to buses, um, over 60s having access to buses, um, which clearly lives, leaves um, a, a bit in between where modal shift is the most difficult thing 
to um, to appreciate. Um, I, I, I come from a generation where it's very normal to do nine to five, uh, but behind me there's generations who are very much gig economy or working virtually was the way that they were uh, they were working anyway um, and obviously the global pandemic has just shoved us um, <laughs> forward uh, quite a bit so it's how do we capture where we are now um, and hold that I mean going forward will Tatran be in for her next Christmas uh, with a mince pie and a cup of coffee or will people decide to still stay virtual and come in that way so that whole kind of um, generational thing, I think, needs to be captured somewhere because I think that's going to have a huge impact on uh, travel demand and supply. Yeah. We're also to a situation where um, the generations won't remember what it was like before 1987 uh, when the buses were um, denationalised. Um, okay. Got one for mince pies and four for council power. I'll be there. <laughs> okay. Um, anyone else on this one? Anything else you want to say, Jonathan? <clears throat> I, um, no, I, I'm just agreeing with the, the points that uh, that are being um, made. It's very difficult to to highlight some of those um, levels of detail in, in these slides, but um, they're exactly the kind of um, points that um, that we need to cover. OK. You want to move on? No. There, there could be uncertainties around policy, how, how, how transport policy responds, how land use policy responds and how fiscal policy responds to um, all the changing circumstances, particularly technology and, and climate change. Uh, Are there other types of policy um, uncertainties that, that you think might exist in the future? Anyone get any? Anyone can drag themselves away from the which baked goods we would like to have um, debate to uh, <laughs> to uh, any views on that? OK, anything else you want to say, Jonathan? But, um, the final, the final slide, other than this, uh, the, the summary, um, will be um, people's attitudes, uh, and I, I think both um, Councillor Shorts and, and Heather's uh, comments kind of, uh, kind of um, to, um, fall into this this area of as populations move on, what will be the different attitudes of of, of different groups of, of people towards. <laughs> Um, travel in terms of these things may be triggered by pandemics. These things may be triggered by climate change. These things may be triggered by um, technology and the supply of services, which means we've got different transport options out there. Um, there may be triggers that 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 um, change people's attitudes, but um those those attitudes and the people's ability to respond to them may be very different subject to their age, their social economic group, where they live, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And again, these are some of the things that we hope to pull out in, in the um, understanding what the degree of impact is. OK, any, any comments on, on that slide? OK, you want to make any summary, Jonathan? I don't think anybody's coming in on that one. Uh, first of all, I mean, thank you very much for for all the input um, uh, over the last um, hour or so, was it? Yeah, maybe, maybe a little less. Thank you very much for for all the input there. Um, so, in terms of preparing this main issues report internally, so that we can then um, take it out to to engage further with communities and key stakeholders out out there, uh, as I highlighted. Then. Within the report, Appendix A has provided you with a headlines with regard to the nature of the region and the headline social, economic and environmental priorities and, and the significant new travel demands which, which we're predicting for our um, development plans and, uh, and our city, city region deals. 
And, and today, what, we, what we've dis- discussed, um, and, and thank you very much for, for the input, was on the strengths and weaknesses of the transport networks and, and also the uncertainties of travel demand and supply. Um, uh, and uh, as Amy's um, uh, highlighted, certainly with the issue of travel demand and supply, we need to take these, um, those, some of those headings away and understand the, the degree uh, of detail behind those and then report them back to you. In terms of how we um, consider policies and proposals for the future, it's, it's about helping us understand which um, scenarios we want to help promote and which scenarios that we need we need to mitigate against. So, so the next steps um, are actually following, suggesting that the next steps are following the, the issue of Transport Scotland's reports on um, the National Transport Strategy 2 and the STPR, which um, Neil highlighted in, in item seven. Um, then we'd like a further discussion um, to, to wrap up um, the, uh, we would like further discussion on the roles of the potential role of the RTS um, in February with some of these other um, transport, just in case, and some of the other issues that Transport Scotland might have raised. Um, and all that is so that we can then in March, hopefully wrap it up and present a content of the main issues report to you in March to seek approval to, to then consult with, with stakeholders uh, and communities uh, at that point in time. Um, so. Hopefully that seems reasonable. And again, thank you for, for your input. Thank, thank you very much, Jonathan. I think that was helpful. I'm sure um, colleagues found it helpful and certainly there seemed to be uh, a good level of engagement amongst people. So thanks to everyone for taking that forward. Um, so as I say, you know, if you have any, any burning issues that you weren't able to raise today, you know, please uh, pass them on either within your own council, if, you, if that's appropriate, or or to uh, Jonathan Padmore or, or, or to Mark Speed, and that will get passed into the process. So moving on, uh, item 10, um, any other business? Nobody's indicated any, I don't suppose there is any. Anybody got anything they want to raise at this moment? Not seeing anything. Um, uh, as, uh, Councillor Short has just uh, preempted the, the, the next, Meetings for 2021 <clears throat> on the 16th of March, 15th of June, 14th September, and 14th of December. This, I think, it's fair. I think we're in a position to say that the 16th of March meeting will be on Teams, and I think there, you know, I think at some point, I'm not sure where it's the point to have the debate today, but at some point we will have to have a discussion about. Um, I think it's been mentioned about whether, you know, whether we actually do want to do physical face-to-face -face meetings or 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 this sort of format is actually the way forward so we'll have that discussion but I think um, at this point in time I think we're envisaging that 16th of March would definitely be on Teams anyway um, so if that's okay and at some point uh, when it's appropriate we will uh, put an item on the agenda to look at how we organise future meetings. Um, so can I just uh, finish with an apology which has kind of been touched upon in the chat that we should have been meeting in Forfar today and can I apologise that we we did have a brief look at how we could deliver Forfar Bridies to people for lunch and we couldn't find out a way of doing it. So apologies for that. And can I say that um, I think possibly my biggest contribution to uh, Mr Speed's uh, induction to TACTRAN has been to introduce him at least theoretically to the concept of how good a Forfar Bridie is. And I'm sure uh, Councillor Proctor and others will, will, will make that a reality, hopefully before too long. Um, so, um, so <coughs> sorry about that. Just, uh, just kid on that you're having when you're having your lunch that you're having a fantastic for for Friday because uh, it is the, the the highlight of uh, anyone's local government career is going to a meeting in for and get the Friday, no doubt. Um, I have taken can, the hint. <laughs> so can I uh, can I also just uh, uh, as it's the last meeting of the year, thank staff uh, in particular who have been. Who've been who, who've been working hard uh, this year in very difficult circumstances. Um, you know, it's unfair to pick on one person, but you know I think uh, Mark uh, interviewed at the start of a pandemic starts at the start of a pandemic, and uh, you know has, uh, has, has I think has has done remarkably well, and I think other officers uh, also deserve praise for the work that they've done in very difficult circumstances. So can I can I just put that on record? Can I also thank uh, all members of the committee. 
uh, for their uh, contribution over the over the past year. And finally, can I wish you all a very happy Christmas? I uh, hope that you have the best Christmas that you can have in the circumstances. I wish you all the very best for 2021, and uh, let's hope it's uh, better than than 2020 has been in many respects. And uh, thanks very much. And with that, I'll close the meeting. Thanks.